Tonight on Life on the Rock, we have John Edwards, part one. I'll give a reflection and much more. Welcome to Life on the Rock. Tonight our guest is John Edwards. He's the founder of Pew Ministries. And he's going to talk to us tonight about all his work, especially his podcast and his uh, The Narrow Road program that he has. He's got a nice little book, a uh, facilitator book for that. And it's all about helping men to live an authentic Christian life. And he's having great success. So he's going to share with us tonight what he tells men. A lot of men today uh, are broken, and we need a lot of direction. And uh, we also need to be reminded of God's love for us and God's mercy. And God really puts, or John puts that message out there for us to hear. So we're now going to Against the Current video with Father Mark. In canoeing on a river, there's the obvious uh, thing we have to do is avoid rocks. We have to avoid uh, crashing into a rock and swamping the canoe. And in the spiritual life, we have to avoid sin. That's absolutely necessary. That these rocks in our life, these things that causes us to fall or to capsize, do our best to avoid them. So we have to have a good self-knowledge. We have to know our weaknesses. What are our certain patterns of behavior? What are the things we keep falling into? A simple way to do that is say, hey, what are my confessions about? As I go to confession, what am I having to bring back again and again and again? And that self-knowledge is critical in overcoming sin in our life. Not that we can do it by our own efforts and just our knowledge alone, but I know what to pray for. I know what to avo avoid. We have to cooperate with God's grace. And other people can give us that self-knowledge. Prayer, the Holy Spirit can give us that self-knowledge. A good examination of conscience every day, you know, and seeing, hey, where did I fall today? You know, to avoid certain pleasures of the world that trip us up. You know, St. Paul, says that things might be lawful, but they might not be prudent. It's a relative thing. Something that might be a temptation for me might not be a temptation for somebody else. So I have to know what to avoid in avoiding near occasions of sin. And then I have to rely on God. I absolutely cannot do it just by knowledge and my own human effort. I have to come back to God to ask for help, to ask for strength and grace. I have to stay in the present moment and look at the challenges there and say, Lord, help me in this present moment to overcome sin. Give me grace for this present moment. Sometimes we get caught up in worrying about the future. It takes us out of the present. And that's where we meet God. That's where we have to battle the world, the flesh, and the devil. John Edwards, welcome to Life on the Rock. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Yeah, I've enjoyed our afternoon together and hearing more about your ministry and things. And um, I thought we'd first start with uh, kind of your story in general, what happened. You had this big conversion experience. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Well, uh, you know, it's a long story, but I'll, yeah. I'll go through it, yeah. you know, here as quickly as possible. Uh, born and raised in Memphis, Tennessee, and yeah. born and raised Baptist. Grew up at a young age in my faith, just loved evangelizing and going to mission trips and vacation Bible schools and mm -hmm. all those things and grew up with a group of, of, of young people yeah. all the way till 18 and that was really my family. I, I didn't have a lot of friends at school, all mine were church friends and mm -hmm. uh, when, we, when the, we all reached the age of 18, everybody kind of went off to college mm -hmm. and I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I was working for an auto parts place from the time I was 16 and just wound up saying, I'm gonna to go to the University of Memphis. It's where I had grown up being a fan of their basketball program. It was in town, but I had no idea what I wanted to do. I was just gonna to go to school and see if I could figure it out. Mm -hmm. Well, I got on campus and, and pretty quickly I realized I was lonely, right? All these yeah. people I'd grown up with, I didn't have that community right. anymore. So I was seeking that out and I had one person uh, that I was still friends with in town that was a rush chairman of a fraternity. And so I called him and I went and met with him and I rushed and that was the last day I went to church for about 10 years of my life. Mm -hmm. um, I was really seeking a community and was in a place in my life where I would do anything 
to have people like me and to fit yeah. in somewhere else. And unfortunately, uh, there was a lot of drinking and drug abuse and things like that that happened. And uh, I basically tried every drug you could think of other than heroin in college and yeah. made a mistake one night to do cocaine. Mm -hmm. And it was something that followed me through 17 years of my life. Yeah. Um, I eventually dropped out of college and uh, kept working at the auto parts place full time. Became a salesman, was a salesman of the year in this Fortune 250 company, had yeah. all the success, met a beautiful woman that was Catholic. Mm -hmm. uh, she told me uh, in a conversation one time, the guy I'm going to marry will be Catholic. So I figured I was the guy for the job. So <laughs> I signed up yeah. and um, did never really take it seriously, though. Yeah. Married, had a couple of uh, three children, yeah. identical twin girls, and, and my son Jacob was born first. But the, the cocaine followed me through all of that. I was using it as a way to deal with stress and uh, hiding it from my wife and everybody in my life. Mm -hmm. So pretty quickly, I built this this just facade everywhere in my life. I was a different guy everywhere I was. Yeah, yeah. Mask everywhere and and no one knew how broken and lonely and selfish and just just you know, full of, of just regret and sin and everything I was inside. Um, and eventually I had a couple of nights where I had some panic attacks and thought I was gonna actually have a heart attack uh, out of bed one night. So I made the decision that night that I would go to a men's co a conference, a Catholic one in town to go to confession. Yeah. Uh, my mother had died in the midst of all this from mm -hmm. cancer and, and uh, I was not in a good place with God. I was not going to church. I was fighting my wife on it all the time, but I knew how to change or everything yeah. was gonna come falling apart. Yeah. So I went to that men's conference, I went to confession and I decided I was gonna change my life and it yeah. lasted for about four days. Yeah. Um, I sold some stuff at work. I was a 100% uh, commission salesman. Uh, it just got a high off of that sale, mm -hmm. I guess, and decided I'll go celebrate one mm -hmm. last time after I had promised God I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. uh, that was on Holy Thursday. Mm -hmm. So I was arrested by the police uh, coming out of the house, uh, getting the drugs. Yeah. They were watching his house. And so I spent Holy Thursday into Good Friday in jail. Yeah. And while I was there, um, you know, I, I just started realizing I'm going to lose everything, right? All this I've built and this, this personality I've, I've built out there for all these people that probably look at me and think I've got the world by the tail and the house and the car yeah. and the beautiful wife and the kids. Yeah. They're all going to know that I'm just a, I'm a drug addict and mm -hmm. a, a sinner and a mess. And so, uh, you know, as I was sitting in that jail cell, I, I started to have another panic attack. And I remember just sitting there rubbing my arms and rocking back and forth saying, no, 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 no. I'm going to lose everything. I'm going to yeah. lose everything. Yeah. And uh, eventually this, this calm came over me, this peace mm -hmm. I've never felt in my life. And the truest words I've ever said came out of my mouth. I, I said, at least now I don't have to lie anymore. Mm. At least everybody will know who I am. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden I started to look at what went wrong in my life. And I started going, it's the day I walked away from Jesus Christ is when mm. all this went downhill. And I started praying and begging and crying for, for God to just forgive me and, and to please give me a chance to be with my wife and children again forever and let me be the father I should have been and the husband I should have yeah, been. So. Yeah came out of jail and started looking for ways to do that. Yeah, yeah. And you you didn't actually have to serve jail time, but did some service program and things. Sure, and sure. So I, I was arrested under a felony yeah. charge, and yeah. there was a Catholic judge in town mm -hmm. that actually started a program called Diversion, mm -hmm. where if you had some means, you could get into this program, and it was to keep repeat offenders from just steadily yeah. going back in, yeah. trying to rehab and, re, you know, and help people yeah. get out of the yeah. cycle. So I went to that for a year, and um, in the meantime, I went home that night from jail. Uh, that was actually, I, I went home Monday after Easter Sunday, mm -hmm. after I went through court and all those things. I spent the weekend at my dad's and went to a place for mass. I'd only been once in my life years before, and the priest actually stopped me and remembered my name mm -hmm. and said, John, I don't know why your family's not here, but God wants me to tell you everything will be all right. Mm -hmm. So it inspired me to say, that's what I needed, and now I'm going to go learn what it is to be a, a husband yeah. and father. Yeah. So I read a book, Father Larry Richards, Be a Man, the mm -hmm. night I, I, my wife let me come home and decided I'm gonna be different. So I started yeah. reading the scriptures again and praying yeah. every night and just diving into church and going to mass all the time. And yeah. uh, it changed my life. And I, I like the part of your story where you, a friend of you, a friend of yours, you know, convinces you to do some kind of men's gathering. Sure, sure. So, and you almost walked away from it. Tell us about that. Yeah. So. We went to the men's conference a year later, same conference I went to for confession. Yeah. And that year was the first time I, had, I went fully prepared to receive what it was. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd read you know, 70 Catholic books that year, just, just yeah. couldn't get enough of the faith. So there was a guy there that day, wasn't with me, but he went to my parish 
that uh, I'd seen at the event. Well, that night we had an event at church and he was running around so excited. He was just like, mm-hmm. man, I feel great. And he started actually saying some things about confession. He shouldn't have been cheering in public yeah. with women <laughs> and children around. Uh-huh. So I went to tell him, hey, just settle down. Yeah, and, yeah. and he said, I don't understand why I'm acting like this. Yeah. Well, come to find out, it was the first time he'd been to confession in 23 years. Yeah. So Holy, he'd had a Holy Spirit moment. Yeah. And he says, I'm a cradle Catholic. I don't know what the Holy Spirit is. I know yeah. what God and yeah. Jesus yeah. is. Can you tell me about it? So yeah. I started you know, talking to him about it. Yeah. My Baptist roots came alive. I started remembering scripture and then the devil hit me with one of those, um, you know, what are you doing? You're, yeah, you're yeah. an addict and you have no business talking about Jesus. And mm-hmm. so I stopped. Well, he wouldn't let me stop. And so yeah. he said, let's go to dinner one night. Uh-huh. So I went home. I, I wrote down everything about the Holy Spirit I could remember. I had legal pads full of it. We went to dinner and I started sharing all that with him just for him. I had no yeah. intent to do anything yeah. else. And he says, man, this is amazing. You should start a men's group. And I tell him, nope, not your guy. And he keeps on and on. And I keep saying, no, no, no. And he's just relentless. And I finally feel convicted by the spirit to just tell him. I said, Jay, I can't because I've been arrested. I'm on a felony cocaine charge. I've got a 17 year addiction to cocaine. (laughs) And I'm expecting him to go check, please, you know, and leave. All right, we're going to take a quick break. That's a good stopping off point. Come back and he'll finish the rest of the story for us. Welcome back. Um, You're saying no, God's saying yes, though? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what happened. So I wound up sharing everything with him that I basically just shared with you. And I'm expecting him to get up and leave. And he says, wow, that's awesome. You should start a men's group. I I didn't expect that. And he convinced me to. So a week later, we called about 30 men, some he knew, some I knew in the parish together. And our parish had a a great fundraising group, guys Mm -hmm. that would you know, show up and, and raise money and cook barbecue and all those things, but yeah. we never talked about God. Yeah. And so I felt convicted that if we were to do this, I had to go share with those men what I've shared mm-hmm. with you. And as I walked into the room that night, it was dark outside. I could see in, they couldn't see me. And when I reached for the door, I felt this, I heard a voice basically say, don't go in there. If you do, you're going to lose everything. If you tell them all this, they're going to kick your kids out of the school. You're going to get kicked out of the parish. Think about what your wife will feel mm-hmm. like. And I turned and, and let go of the door to walk away. And then I heard, as you hear, like in the Old Testament, that sort of whisper, Mm. uh, John, open the door, right? Like Mm. when you walked out of that cell, you told me you'd be different. So I opened the door. I went in there and I told guys, I said, look, we've got a great men's group, but we never talk about God. And let me know, let let me tell you what can happen when you, when you let that become the, uh, a problem in your life where you're not talking about Jesus. And I went, blah. Mm. And I told them all, and I was crying and just sharing as, as honestly as I could. Yeah. Um, at the end of that, I just said, look, we should start a men's group. I don't know what I'm doing. I know you don't know why you were called here tonight. So if you want to leave, no hard feelings. I get it. And I sat down and I got to tell you, like, I thought guys were going to leave, but guys started standing up and saying, I'm a bad dad. I care more about my job and, and, and my work than I do my family, by the way, I spend my time. They started talking about they were addicted to pornography. One of them showed up drunk. I mean, there was all these things. And that's the night that God showed me the power of vulnerability in my life. And you have a great phrase that you say so many of these men have a question like, where is God in my mess? Yeah. Yes, sir. And why did that resonate with them? Well, I, I just think so many men were raised to sort of it, what it means to be a man is to put your head down, to work hard, to never complain, to never have feelings. If you can't figure something out, then you need to work at it till you do. So men are just always in this one man army sort yeah. of mode of life, right? I don't need anybody or anything, right. but we all still have these issues we struggle with. Mm-hmm. And instead of being able to share and become vulnerable and tell people like this facade I put on, isn't me, I'm broken inside and I need help. Yeah. And, and instead of that, we, we lock it all in and the devil lives in those things and he holds us hostage to those things. And so we, 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 we kind of reach out in vices and drinking and all these different things because yeah, yeah. we're trying to deal with it in some way. Mm-hmm. But when we become vulnerable, we allow that stuff to come out and, and we realize that, that the devil has no power over us anymore. You yeah. know, there's two definitions of vulnerability we were talking about before the show. There's the one of the world that says to be vulnerable as a man, you're, you're, you know, you're weak, you're less masculine, you're susceptible to attack. 
But God has a definition, he tells St. Paul. Right. He, you know, St. Paul has a thorn in his side. He asks God to remove it, and he says, no, my power is made perfect in weakness. And so from that, St. Paul realizes, if I'm to boast, let it be of my weaknesses, my insults, my burdens, because when I'm weak, I'm strong. Yeah. And so where strength and vulnerability seems weird to men, it's exactly what it is, is when I'm vulnerable with these things, the devil no longer has power over me anymore. I can open that door, that virtual prison cell I'm in, yeah. I moan, shame, fear, frustration, uh, and, and walk outside and understand that I don't, I'm not held prisoner anymore and that what I thought was pain and torture by leaving that prison cell is actually peace and joy and the happiness I've been looking yeah. for. And so like sharing one's own weakness and maybe in a small group setting, it, mm -hmm. it opens up for other people to share their stuff, yes. right? And, and that's strengthening, right? That people could encourage one another, walk together, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it just reminds me of, you know, the love God, love neighbor, you know, it's, we're saved as a, as a, the body of Christ united together. There's got to mm -hmm. be that communion. That's the way it's designed, not just me and God hammering it out. But, yes, um, sir. So some of the topics you all talk about, uh, you have, it's very much uh, virtue oriented. Um, mm -hmm. Let's hit upon some of those. Um, like courage. I know you talk about courage sure. in your book. And, yeah, that's yeah. actually the virtue of the narrow road this month. Mm -hmm. And we basically help men live the virtue. You know, yeah. the catechism says that a virtue is a firm and habitual disposition to do the good. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's missing a lot is we want to be good, but we don't make up our mind to do the things that we need to do to be good, to be virtuous. So those are things we have to choose. You can say all day long, I want to be a virtuous man and nothing's going to happen. But mm -hmm. you pick a virtue, something like courage, and you start to look for how you can live it practically in your life. So yeah. we have a resource called The Narrow Road, and every month's a different virtue. And basically men are they're reading the gospel every day and, and asking God, what are you saying to me in my life? So they're starting a conversation with the Lord. They're praying, so another conversation with the Lord. But then every day it's how am I living the virtue of courage with God this week or with my wife the next or with my children or with my neighbor? And it forces them to look for opportunities. You know, all, guys are into all these superheroes, or excuse me, superhero movies mm -hmm. and things. I am too. I love them. Mm -hmm. But we don't often get a chance to push somebody out of the front of a bus to be virtuous. <laughs> right. But every day we have a small yeah. chance to put our phone down or something where our children want our time. Right. And that's choosing virtue in the moment. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's what we try to do is just encourage men and say it's possible. Right. Mm -hmm. This is possible for an everyday guy like you that has struggles and, and, and you want to find God, you can find him in your mess. Yeah. And then yeah. learn what he wants you to learn and live it in your life. Yeah. Yeah. The narrow road booklet there, I was looking at it and I like just that simple question, like, what does this gospel passage passage say to you? You know, what's striking you about it? Mm -hmm. And uh, usually because that's something maybe we're struggling with or something we got to have to deal with and to foster that real conversation with God in prayer. And then just a simple thing of making like some some things like, OK, this is the way I want to exercise courage this week or whatever it mm -hmm. is. I thought that was powerful. Like it was kind of simple, but it's like, well, are we doing this simple thing right in front of us? You sure, know, that's sure. often presented. So. Well, I think men need simple, right? If you yeah, hand me a book yeah. that says, here's the 558 ways to follow Jesus in your life, I'm probably going to put it down pretty quickly. Right. But if you give me a couple of simple things that are based on really what Jesus asked us to do in the scriptures, yeah. then men can, they can say, I can handle this. Yeah. And they'll start doing it and they'll build those habits in their life and then it'll become part of their yeah. life. And you've seen some good fruit, like men, their marriages improving, coming back to church. And yes, sir. Uh, I, uh, I, I get teary out a lot. We'll get yeah. emails from yeah. a guy telling me I was about to lose everything. I was about mm -hmm. to lose my wife or I was about to leave my wife or something like yeah. that. Or I've always wanted to be a great dad, but I've never known how to do it. Mm -hmm. And they've just said, this is so simple, but it's so profound. It's giving me yeah. opportunities and I'm looking for them now. Right. I wasn't right. before. And, and they've just said thank you for it you know and of course all glory be to God he's the one that does all of this through every, all each and every one of us but uh, yeah there's been a lot of great things where men have shared how their lives mm -hmm. have changed and some contact info if they want to find out more about your program what you offer and sure uh, yeah you can go to just again the pew.com that's our website the podcast is there any interviews we've done short videos and then also the narrow re uh, road resources are there so you can sign up as an individual or parish groups can do it there's videos that go along with it so you can find everything at just a guy on the pew.com right so we're going to do a second show with you and okay. it's going to air next week so uh we got a lot more to talk about but uh thanks for joining us yes this sir week. thank you
What a great interview. Yeah. He was he had something to say, didn't he? <laughs> a lot of experiences. A uh, couple points he made that really resonate and struck me. You know, he's sitting in that jail, feel like he's losing everything. And what does he say? He said, at least I don't have to lie anymore. Mm -hmm. There's that duplicitous heart that just tears at us, that we know we want to overcome sin in our life. We want to, you know, be better men, grow closer to the Lord. And I think it's so key that that first step of being honest, yeah. of recognizing the evil we've done, repenting think, of it. Yeah, I think there's kind of an irony there because he finds himself in jail and he admits to himself and realizes I can stop lying to myself. But when he was out in the world, just living his life, you know, and he points out that the devil holds us hostage and that we do get enslaved and with a lot of vices, a lot of things going on in our lives. But I thought, you know, he, he explained it kind of well that we start to wear a mask, you know, and for men, we, you get really caught up into yourself. There is that in the selfish that he didn't mention about mm -hmm. that we can really just kind of, it's almost something very weird that we almost uh, become somebody we're not, but we know who we're supposed to be. You yeah. know, we know that our Christian calling, we know what that is, you know, but a lot of times we do drift along, you know, as we are marching towards Christ. We get off that path of goodness and we right. find ourselves in just a weird world. <laughs> right, right. And that those vices, like you said, it, it turns us inward. It makes us mm -hmm. more selfish and closes us off. So we got to be honest, repent, yeah. open up to God, open up to others. And the other point he made tonight I thought was so good was that men ask him, said, well, where is God in my mess? Yeah. You know, I'm on the brink of divorce. I've got, I'm caught up in this sin. Where is God and all that? Does he really have something to say to me? Is he really going to act in my life? And John was saying, yes, you know, open up to others about it, you know, confess mm -hmm. and you have trusted friends and share, get some strength from others, from the sacraments. Yeah. And we find God in a powerful yeah. way in our life. And it's not a walk. We walk alone, you know, when, and when, when we do, we just get swallowed up by the yeah. world. Yeah. You know, we're part of the church. We're part of a community and we're really saved through the mystical body of Christ, the church, mm -hmm. you know, not just spiritually, but even with a lot of the temporal difficulties that we encounter in this life. And there is a real healing and real redemption whenever we do connect with the church. All right. So those are some points to ponder in your heart as you go into that vineyard, some seeds to sow as you go along. May our Heavenly Father shine His face upon you. May He give you His peace. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We'll see you next week on Life on the Rock. There are days that I still long for purpose To see the plans that you have willed for me And sometimes I am walking through the valley I'm certain you are always right beside me Cause even when I can't see can't see and you've gone before me before me and i will walk by faith i will walk by faith the future is a mystery a mystery forever will you lead me lead me and i will walk by faith i will walk by my heart begs of you and if you give me more than I can handle I will pray for strength to make it through cause even when I can't see I can't see and you've gone before me before me and I will walk by faith I will walk by faith the future is a mystery.